Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Stuart Kinnair. I'm the CEO of Interface Fluidics. Uh, I'm joined today by Adam Fair, um, who's another member of our team. Adam, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Well, thanks for joining, everybody. I'm Adam Fair, as Stuart mentioned, and um, I am a relatively new account manager with Interface Fluidics. And before, before joining, um, I spent a number of years working in different labs, uh, looking at different applications. Water chemistry was part of many of those uh, roles that I worked in previously, and um, I'm happy to, to be here today with all of you. Great. Thanks. So um, just to give everybody a, a starting point, um, we're here today to talk about water chemistry. And I guess to give you all some context here, water chemistry is a thing that Interface deals with on day in, day out. Um, however, Interface is a testing and technology company. Uh, we're not chemists, fundamentally. Um, but what's really important when we're doing, in order to do good testing, we want to really make sure we understand what's going on. And so today the presentation is less about, you know, you know Adam's going to share a lot of his, his detailed experience, but we're sharing Interface's experience and, and the kinds of issues that we've dealt with as clients have sent us their fluids and we've worked on their uh, products and situations. And so at the end of the day, this is about us sharing our experience um, as a company that's tested hundreds and hundreds of different uh, fluid combinations. Um, this is not going to be a full education in water chemistry. Uh, this is, and so if there are folks in the, in the audience that are experts, which there likely are, and I think I, I see a few folks here that have a lot of knowledge, um, please feel free to chime in and share knowledge. Um, this is more about us sharing knowledge than, than us, uh, you know, really giving you all the answers. Um, so having said that, you know, we're here to talk about water chemistry and overview of testing methodologies and technologies. Um, we're going to go into how does water interact with that chemistry that you're pumping in your wells. Um, we're going to talk about risk and how it manifests itself and how you can manage it uh, out in the field, especially these days. Um, and then finally, looking at some specific methods for selecting chemistry and doing different tests so that you can make an informed decision. Now, the reason we're doing this is because of you folks in the audience. You've asked us uh, over and over again over the last few months here, um, can you put on some content like this? It's the most common question I get is, how is my fluid? How are my fluids going to interact, especially with you know, the drought in Western Canada and across a lot of North America, um, where water is, is scarce and we're looking at alternative water sources where we haven't before. Um, a lot of folks also just recognize that using fresh water for this for fracturing or injecting into oil and gas systems um, is not you know, a sustainable practice uh, in the very long term. And so we want to find alternatives to that. Um, as well, there's a perception that uh, produced water or other sort of alternative water sources are highly expensive, um, and they can be, but they can also be uh, opportunities for cost savings. And so we want to sort of get through a bit of that. And then um, the last thing I'll say here and the place we're going to start is, can we start trying to demystify the water water chemistry itself? Um, it's a really highly complex topic, and, and I don't think any one hour session is going to get through it all. Um, but we want to give, hopefully today, people some rules of thumb and some, some ways to look at a water report and say, well, I know at least what I'm going to do, or at least where I'm going to look, and how I can start asking questions about that to the, to the experts that I'm working with. So in general, um, you know, we want to here today is to demystify water chemistry. You know, water and general oil field chemistry is a highly complicated topic. Um, and it's not necessarily part of the major engineering curriculum that is, uh, but it's engineers that are being asked to make these decisions often. And so it isn't really possible to make everyone experts, as we said, but we want to give you folks um, the tools to identify risk and ask the right questions of your suppliers. As well, you know, there's a lot of chemistry expertise uh, throughout the industry in the room today. Um, and often where that sits is inside of the chemical suppliers. And so, you know, going to those folks is, is hist historically a, a good option. Um, and we'll talk a bit about a bit more about that today. However, if there is one thing I want everybody to take away today um, is that ultimately water is a product of its environment and how it's been treated. And that is uh, the only universal thing that we're going to know about water. So where to start? Um, starting at the easiest place first, hopefully, is looking at water sources. 
Now, in general, we hear talk about either fresh water or produced water. Um, however, that's a bit of a oversimplification because not all fresh water is going to be the same and not all produced water is the same. We know this intuitively, um, but I think it's helpful to sort of call out where there is some language that's maybe problematic. So when we talk about fresh water, really that fresh water is subjective. Um, there's a large amount of variability, whether you're talking about surface water, groundwater, municipal water, or potable versus non-potable water. Um, you might all call these fresh water, but they're all going to have very different compositions and behave very differently. Ultimately, fresh water is this amazing solvent uh, and place for bugs to live. And so when you're thinking about, you know, water sources, fresh water, you need to, you still need to watch out for biology or remnants of biology, uh, hardness or alkalinity, dissolved materials um, like gases in that water, uh, as well as residual chemistry from other treatment processes that that water has gone through. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about fresh water is fresh water is really only fresh water until it hits your rock. Um, it is that great solvent. So the second it starts going into a system, it starts interacting. And now you're dealing with uh, ultimately a non fresh water in it. So produced water as well, very hard to define. And, and ultimately produced water is a label that we give it, um, but it has very little utility for decision making alone all the label produced tells us is that it came from a well or some other kind of industrial waste stream not if it's actually going to be useful for your process on the day uh, the biggest differences here between produced water and fresh water is that it ultimately has more dissolved materials from the system that it was produced from it likely has re residual chemistry in the oil field that's uh, you know maybe it's residual frac chemistry or other products that came from a frac or if you're recycling water, uh, you've got chemistry from other processes. Uh, and finally, it's not uncommon to have residual oil present in produced water. And that's probably the biggest uh, thing that you're going to find in produced water that is very unlikely to be found in fresh water. So that's, that's my sort of summary and intro here. Um, I'll remind folks, feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go, but I'll turn it over here to Adam to go through a more detailed overview of uh, water chemistry um, and talk about how it's measured and understood as well as some key considerations for you and the audience to keep in mind. With that, I'll say, turn it over to you, Adam. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, so I guess the, the most important thing in understanding any water source is gonna be the analytical chemistry that goes behind characterizing it and you know, at Interface, we see a lot of different types of, of water analysis, but what we really like to see is a complete water analysis, which is a comprehensive analytical program that looks at the quality of your water. And um, what you're going to see in a typical report that comes from a complete water analysis is first and foremost pH. Um, and that's important because it dominates scaling processes it dominates how your chemicals are gonna behave, especially if they're ionic. Um, and then the second thing that uh, you'll see, sometimes it will have, it'll have its own section on a water report is hardness and alkalinity. And we'll talk about the definitions of it later, but what's important to recognize at this point is that hardness and alkalinity play a really important role in scaling processes. Um, so, uh, the next thing is anion and cation concentrations in balance. Almost every complete water report is going to have two separate columns, one for cations, the positively charged, and anions, the negatively charged. And what, uh, what happens there is the concentrations of each anion and cation are broken down into their charge equivalents, and they're added up to create a balance. And we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Um, conductivity and resistivity is a measurement that's made in almost every type of water analysis, not just these comprehensive complete water analysis, because it's a quick snapshot at how much dissolved solids you have. Uh, so it can be really useful for monitoring a process over time. And if you see a change in conductivity, then you know that your water chemistry has changed. So uh, a really useful tool for ongoing monitoring. And the same goes for oxidation reduction potential. This has to do with uh, redox chemistry, and it's an important parameter for understanding corrosion processes, but it's also important for understanding 
the state of existence that your transition metals are going to be in in your water as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later too. Turbidity is uh, just a term that describes how clear your water is. Is it cloudy? Is it clear? And what it does is it assigns a number to it. So it's an actual measurement of clarity. And then there's a total dissolved and suspended solids. So your total dissolved solids are going to come from your anion and cation concentrations. Um, and it's going to be a sum of all of those in milligrams per liter. And then, you know, when we're talking about water compatibility, uh, I guess the biggest concern around water compatibility is solids formation. And sometimes our water sources already have solids in them before they've entered any of our processes. So suspended solids uh, is a way of measuring how much how much of that you've already got to begin with. Dissolved gases are a little bit more rare uh, to see on a complete water analysis, but it is found on you know the highest quality of comprehensive water reports. And it's it's important because things like H2S, that's a dissolved gas that that could potentially cause corrosion issues and scaling issues that we'll talk about later. And dissolved oxygen is also an important consideration um, that uh, can dominate the, the transition metals. And we'll talk about that too. So all of the things that I've mentioned just now really focus on the, the inorganic components of water. Um, but as Stuart mentioned, oftentimes there's residual oil as as an inor uh, sorry as an organic impurity in your water, and that can be extended to residual chemistries or biological components from bacteria that are living in the water too. So uh, those are the main components of a complete water analysis. Great, thanks. So along with all of those data sets, you're often going to see different types of diagrams on the water reports. I've listed a few here that focus solely on the relative abundance of different components in your water. The most common one I would say is probably going to be the stiff diagram. And there's an example image here of one. Um, all it's doing is trying to communicate to you what the charge equivalence is of each ion that you've got. And it doesn't necessarily communicate whether or not that water will be useful for a given process, and it doesn't necessarily communicate a scaling tendency or anything like that. It's just trying to communicate how much charge there is of this specific ion graphically. And Pi diagrams, Collins diagrams, and the rest that are listed here do the same thing, just in a different format. So, uh, the, the most important, or one of the most important parameters is hardness and alkalinity. And I've grouped them here together because they're, they have an interdependent relationship that dominates many different scaling processes. Um, and both of them have a couple of different definitions and misconceptions that we need to address. So hardness was actually previously defined as a, a value of how much soap you could add to the water before it would start to lather. Um, and that's where this concept actually was born out of. But now the more modern definition actually has two different kind of mainstream approaches. And the first one is uh, the total cationic strength. So it'll be the sum of all of the positive charges in your water. And the second one focuses more on scaling, uh, scaling cations, which is much more common in terms of a definition of hardness. And oftentimes it's even selected down to just calcium and magnesium, but really all of these two plus ions like barium, iron two plus, those can all contribute to uh, scaling hardness as well. The next uh, parameter is alkalinity. And the first misconception that we need to address is that alkalinity is not the same as pH. Um, alkalinity's textbook definition is how much acid can you add to water before it reaches a certain pH? And that's it, that's all it means. And so any base can contribute to the alkalinity of your water, but the most common ones in fresh water are going to be um, carbonate and bicarbonate alkalinity. And then for industrial waste streams, 
you might see hydroxide present or uh, from produced waters, you'd see things like phosphates and borates. So those can all contribute to alkalinity as well. And uh, alkalinity forms a buffer system with weak acids, uh, particularly from the acid gas in reservoirs. So things like CO2, uh, H2S will interact with alkalinity to establish a buffered pH. And um, oftentimes these two parameters, hardness and alkalinity are reported the with the same unit, milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate. And the reason that that's done is because it, it's trying to communicate to uh, the person who's reading the water report that if all of the hardness were to drop out of scale, how much would there be? And same for alkalinity. So if all the alkalinity were to precipitate as calcium carbonate, how much would there be? And the real concern is like when both of those numbers are relatively high, that equates to a scaling risk. Great. We'll get into sort of how to, what, what does high mean in a bit here? Yeah. So the next parameter is your anion and cation tables. Um, they're going to break down, obviously, all of the different components by charge. And by adding those two columns up in their milligrams per liter units, you get the total dissolved solids. Um, but if you add up all of the charges in terms of their molar equivalence of charge in the solution, then you get the total ionic strength. So that's the difference between those two. Total ionic strength focuses on basically the concentration of charge, and then TDS focuses on a mass unit. Um, and it's important to recognize that um, in an ideal world, if you were to compare the total charges of positive and negative on a water report, they should be equal if the water analysis was perfect. But there's no such thing as a perfect water analysis. And one of the indicators of quality is the difference between the total positive charges in your water measured and the total negative charges measured. So the only heuristic that we can really apply here is that as the difference in your charge balance gets bigger, the lower the quality is of that water report. When you say lower quality, do you mean they're they're missing some ion in there? Like what can you help folks understand that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, any difference in the anion and cation balance on, on a water report suggests that either one component has been overestimated or another component has been underestimated, or maybe you're missing an analyte entirely. Right. So at Interface, we hear a lot about iron. And uh, iron is a problematic ion, but it, it also extends to other transition metals. But for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to talk a, a little bit more in depth just about iron and then show you the tools that you can apply to other transition metals in your water. Iron is problematic because it has two different oxidation states, uh, common ones, iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. Iron 2 plus is most commonly found in groundwaters because there is no oxygen in those waters to oxidize it to iron 3. And iron 3 is very uh, insoluble in most forms. So what happens is, you know, uh, if any oxidizing agent comes or uh, comes in contact with iron 2 plus, it will convert that to iron 3, which then will form a scale. And um, Iron 2 and Iron 3 can also form scales with hydrogen sulfide. So uh, that's the other concern around that. And then, you know, transition metals uh, as a whole can, can act as catalysts for many different reactions. So you would uh, have that concern around chemical compatibility if you were to find other transition metals there uh, besides just iron. So things like manganese and molybdenum might might be problematic for chemical compatibility. And when we're talking about transition metals, it's important to understand which of those you have in your water source. Uh, if it's a fresh water source that's been like exposed to 
atmospheric oxygen for long periods of time, it's almost certain that you won't have any iron two in there. It'll all be iron three. But if you've got groundwater and you need to understand which one you have, you need to protect that sample and have a little bit of awareness around how you're treating that sample to make sure that it's not exposed to oxygen for too long. Otherwise you won't know what type of iron you've got and it might just precipitate out to the bottom of your sample. So we've got an example here of when, you know, when you're out looking at trying to get a sample of your produced water, for example, being able to understand that it's really important how you take that sample, because if you take a produced water sample that has zero oxygen in it, put it into a bottle that has a lot of headspace with air, any of that iron two is likely going to have that, have that reaction and change by the time you get it into the lab. And so you don't know what's actually in your water coming out of your well versus what you're, you think you're pumping essentially. Yeah. So there are some tools that can help you to understand what type of iron you have uh, when you're interpreting your water report. And that's why I mentioned ORP at the beginning. Oxidation reduction potential is often something folks who are really concerned about corrosion are paying attention to. Um, and that certainly is the case here too, because a lot of our tubing is made of iron and, and things like that. But, you know, to if you want to understand the species, uh, the, the state of the, the iron that's in your groundwater, it's you can look at these types of speciation plots here where they look at pH and ORP to, to understand what type of iron you have, whether it's going to be more likely to form a, a specific type of solid. Um, and these speciation plots are often available for different uh, transition metals that you might have in your water. So if you have an ORP value, and you've got your pH, you can get a really good idea of what's most likely to be present in your water. So there's obviously a lot to, to see here and, and a lot to interpret in these water uh, chemistry processes. Um, and so we, you know, when we were putting this together, we, our goal was we're not going to be able to provide the, all the answers for everybody at all times, but we thought, can we give folks a, a water quality checklist of here are the, the low hanging fruit, make sure you check these things every time you get a water analysis so that you can understand risk profile. And so um, basically we put together this water quality checklist that is far from the final answer uh, by any means. It is a intended to be a guide um, to asking questions uh, of your suppliers. Um, and I see I've got a question here from James. James, I'll get to that as soon as I get to the end of this slide. Um, so just to give you an example of how we're thinking about this, um, we're going to supply this as a handout to all the attendees of the um, of the webinar so that you can you know print it off and have it sit on your desk while you're looking at your next water report. Um, we're really trying to cover here two things, scaling risk um, and polymer compatibility, because polymer and scale are the two things that people ask us the most about. And I think it's probably the most um, people, place where people spend the most money uh, dealing with water chemistry. So, you know, our pH is really just going to tell us that it has a high impact on scaling, um, but pH doesn't tell us anything on its own, other than that there is, it's going to impact everything else. Um, when we're looking at polymer compatibility, polymers like friction reducers are more tuned towards neutral fluids. So pH is in the range of 5.5 to 8. Um, you likely don't have high risk. Outside of that, you might start having uh, challenges. You might need to look at a, a polymer that's designed to have higher um, compatibility with P different pH uh, systems. As Adam mentioned before, hardness and alkalinity are sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, alone, any one of them may or may not tell you anything specific. But the real question is when we have hardness and alkalinity together uh, in one system, at, you know, we tried to pick a range here of essentially above 1,000 ppm of both of these, so 1,000 milligrams per liter of uh, CaCO3, you're likely going to have scaling, and it's time to start thinking about what you're going to do about that, um, if, especially in situations where you have uh, carbonate or hydroxides, um, you're definitely going to start seeing um, that scaling, so it's time to start thinking about things there. Um, 
Our transition metal side here is really a subset of your hardness. Um, they represent a scaling risk and as well as the risk of catalytical degradation of your chemical additives. So again, understanding the concentration and, and asking your vendors about how they're going to handle that uh, is our suggestion there. Um, a few more things here that we'll, we'll call out here, like the TDS um, is something that people think about a lot. It's probably one of the things I hear about the most. Um, it doesn't really tell you anything about your scaling risk though. And really the question is, is, is polymer viscosity. Um, salts are going to degrade your polymer viscosity and impact it. Um, so you're going to need to adjust your loadings appropriately according to those. Um, TDS here is just giving you an idea of you know, what category of question you need to ask. Um, when we're dealing with uh, sulfide, H2S or iron sulfide, um, basically in any sour wells or wells with iron bearing mineralogy, you need to be really careful and understand you know, what are we putting into these systems because they're highly reactive systems. For example, uh, sulfate breakers, so like an ammonium per sulfate breaker um, combined with your uh, with barium, if you've got barium in your formation or in your water, um, that will cause scaling almost 100% of the time. You know, whether or not that's uh, critical or, or, or uh, catastrophic or not is, is to be determined, but ultimately per sulfate breakers and barium bearing brines just should not be used together because again, you're adding these sulfides and sulfates into your into your system that are going to react. Um, dissolved oxygen, again, if we wanna understand our iron two plus, we need to understand where the dissolved oxygen is coming from. Um, waters not, that are not exposed to atmosphere will have no oxygen, but if you've stored produced water at surface in a pond or a holding tank for a period of time that's exposed, that producer produced water should be assumed to have oxygen in it now. And lastly, acid gas, um, you wanna keep an eye out for pHs that are greater than six. Um, H2S is going to in increase your scaling risk. Um, you're gonna look for transition metals there. CO2 can both increase or decrease your scaling risk depending on where you're looking at it in the system. Um, in the formation, it's going to actually reduce your scaling risk because it is gonna acidize uh, the fluids. But as you produce that fluid, that CO2 is going to um, come out of solution. And now your pH is going to change. And as soon as we have pH changing, now we've got scaling happening. Uh, overall, though, those, you know, the other thing to think about is your on your the effect of acid gas on your polymers. It's going to degrade your polymer. How and, and what characteristics is going to how it's going to do that um, is going to be dependent on the product, though. So you should talk to your suppliers about that. Um, so that's, you know, overall, we tried to go, go through what are some heuristics or some rules of thumb we can think about when we're looking at these water quality reports so that you can start asking questions. Uh, ultimately, this is not the final answer, but it is going to give you some more tools to think about. Um, I've got a question here from James. What do you recommend for sampling procedures of produced water in order to prevent oxidation and precipitation of the iron that's present? Adam. Yeah, yeah. So there, I think it's important to recognize that um, there isn't necessarily a perfect uh, or the perfect, what am I trying to say? The, the ideal situation would be to take a water sample and to store it under the head, the same headspace that would be found in the reservoir. So if you had like a gas sample, you could store it under pressure, but that's not practical, right? Um, nobody does that. And so some of the approaches that you can do uh, to prevent this are making sure that the water is stored in a container that has an inert atmosphere uh, or an atmosphere of maybe an acid gas like CO2. Um, using a headspace of CO2 would also prevent uh, the sample from scaling before it even reaches the laboratory. So those are some of the approaches that um, that you can have that you can have um, to preserve a water sample. But ultimately, the best practice is going to be to to conduct the testing that you want on that water as soon as possible. Um, is is one of the other approaches that you can can have when when you're concerned about that. Another question in here from Bob Gales: Have you developed microfluidic chips to test impact at in situ? i.e. with native hydrocarbons or what chemicals best solve problems. Yeah, we will go through some examples at the end here, Bob, of, of some case studies where we've looked at scaling tendencies and other sort of compatibilities with waters, um, as well as with oil in place. So 
uh, if that doesn't answer your question at the end, you can um, raise your hand or send me a note and uh, we'll try and get a more specific answer for you in a bit here. All right, we'll keep going here. So we talked about water. Um, let's talk a bit about frac chemistry. How are the chemical packages that you're buying going to be affected by the makeup water concentration? So the most common additives that you know we deal with at Interface are friction reducer, breakers, scale inhibitors, biocide, surfactant, corrosion inhibitors, clay stabilizers, as well as chelating agents. It's a big long list of stuff. Um, and the way we approached sort of tackling this problem in this webinar is, well, where are you spending the most money? Probably today. And that's in the top three, friction reducers, breakers, and scale inhibitors. Um, so we're gonna stick to that. Um, you know, we could probably do an entire uh, webinar on waters and surfactants, um, but uh, we're gonna try and stay there. If you have questions at the end, we're more than happy to get into that. Um, but you know, a lot of this conversation around iron and friction reducers and friction reducer compatibility um, goes back to this episode, or this issue of JPT back in September of 2020. Say so our phone started ringing the second this issue hit the stands. Um, and it's something we've been working on quite heavily ever since. So Adam will walk us through here some of the ideas. Of how, how does salt concentration affect your polymers? Yeah, so there's, uh, in, in general, a higher ionic strength is going to impact the solubility of other ionic components. So if you've got, uh, you know, an anionic or a cationic friction reducing polymer, that uh, the solubility of that polymer is going to be impacted by different ions more so than others. But it's important to to look for solids formation uh, of your of your polymer. And then, in terms of friction reduction, as those uh, molecules start to clump together in the high ionic strength, like shown in this diagram here, their efficacy goes down because it's it's losing the ability to to surface treat the the porous media. And then, the probably the most obvious impact is going to be on your viscosity. As these polymer chains begin to clump up into little uh, balls like this, fish eyes or gummy bears, whatever you want to call it, um, viscosity will be impacted quite dramatically. And if it's something that isn't impacting uh, the solubility of your polymer, it's it's going to reduce the, the viscosity because those polymer chains have gone from a, a long chain, now they're shrunken down into this random coil. Um, and then cross-linking is probably the most concerning um, because it is going to solidify that polymer basically into a very, like almost like a plastic. Um, and that's going to reduce the efficacy of that material as well. Yeah, like I, I remember the first time I learned that, you know, the kids toys that my kids play with and the friction reducer we use in the field are essentially the same molecule with different degrees of cross-linking uh, to be very reductive about it. Um, you know, that's I, to me, that's really indicative of sort of what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's just important to recognize that TDS itself, like ionic strength on its own, has its impact on all of these parameters, but each and every one of these is going to be impacted differently by different salts. And that's demonstrated by this figure that we've put in here on the bottom left. You know, different salts are going to have very different effects on performance. So that's why testing is, is really important. Yeah. And testing in the fluids that you're going to use them in. Yeah. yeah. So just to give an example here of, of what we, when we're talking about cross-linking, what does that mean? Um, if you've ever eaten at a fancy restaurant, I know um, you've probably come across these little pearls of whatever that chefs love to make. Uh, that's a polymer called sodium alginate uh, derived from seaweed that is then uh, put into a calcium chloride solution. So we've got a lot of calcium uh, in there and you can give an example of what this actually looks like on this website by chef steps. So we're taking and dripping a polymer liquid into a bath of calcium carbonate. And you can see we're instantly turning these things into little balls of flavor, but I think we probably agree that we don't necessarily want to have this situation going into our wells uh, as much as they might be delicious in this situation. 
Um, so this is an example of sort of you know, perfect example of what cross-linking looks like in the real world. So the question then is, how can this actually be counteracted? And Adam's got a few points to make here. Yeah, absolutely. So there are many different types of friction reducing polymers available on the market. And that's not the only additive where you've got options. I mean, there are a myriad of different surfactants. So the right chemistry is out there. It's about finding it. Um, and the chemists who study this a lot more in depth than I have would understand relationships like based on this water chemistry, should I use an anionic or a cationic polymer? Um, should it be a copolymer of different types of compositions put together, or maybe even a tur polymer? There are lots of different options. Um, you can also manipulate the pH of the water that you're doing the injections uh, with, the, like your base fluids. You can buffer it with different types of materials uh, to achieve the pH where your chemistry is gonna work the best. Um, and you can be selective about the type of breaker that you're using. Like uh, Stuart brought up that um, breaker, like a persulfate breaker would not be compatible with fluids with containing barium because the, the side product of the breakdown of persulfate is of course the sulfate ion and barium sulfate is uh, a scaling risk. There, It's virtually completely insult, uh, insoluble. So you wouldn't want to use that. You would want to look to a different breaker if you really wanted to use one. And then uh, well, what the, are some examples of those other breakers, Adam? Yeah, there's perborates. Um, like, I guess the most fundamental, almost all these breakers are going to be different oxidizing agents. So even something like a peroxide would be kind of an option. Um, but it's just important to recognize that breakers are just oxidizing agents that oxidize the polymer. and uh, As well so as whatever else they, it runs into. Exactly. And that's that's part of the problem with breakers. Like I mentioned before, if you've got a lot of iron two kicking around, an oxidative breaker, you might you might want to reconsider whether or not you want to use something like that at all, because uh as soon as you oxidize, as soon as you put in something like a breaker, it's it's not going to discriminate just for your polymer. It's going to oxidize anything in its path. Um so in order to get around that, you know, you can use uh iron inhibitors or what they really are is chelating agents and they form complexes to kind of keep the iron soluble in whichever form it's it's present and then of course you can have a water treatment program for your produced water to remove any problematic ions that you can that you can do economically uh, so there are a couple different options and this is where working with chemical companies and chemists is really important because they're they're going to be the ones who can look at a water report and really come up with these strategies for you. And then folks like us will test them. Perfect. Uh, so that really covers uh, the friction reducer side of things. I think we've gone through, you know, what are they? What are we going to see? How do they react to the different things that are in there? And what can you do about it? Uh, the next side of uh, water that we wanted to talk about is scale probably the most, uh, you know, the other big bogeyman in the room. Um, so if we wanted to try and understand scale, it's uh, it's an interesting topic because in the oil field, we talk about uh, scale, which categorizes both inorganic scale and we call uh, organic scale uh, as well. And really what we're saying is this is any solid that spontaneously precipitates from fluids in oil and gas wells. Uh, organic uh, scale is probably better understood as a paraffin or wax, asphaltines, gas hydrates, and fundamentally, organic scales are uh, should be understood as thermophysical properties of a certain hydrocarbon. So this is a physical property of a fluid. When we talk about inorganic scale, is more accurately understood as a precipitate formed from a chemical reaction. So the fundamental difference here is or inorganic scale is generally going to be caused by the uh, reaction of two fluids, whereas the organic scale is going to be caused by the changes in conditions that a, that a fluid sees. There are exam um, you know, exceptions to that rule in inorganic scales where you have composition change causing changes in solubility, but in general, um, to try and say, be broad about it, um, that's what we're talking about. It. You know, I'll play a video here. So 
at interface, we test for both inorganic scale and organic scale. And the left side here is an example of uh, precipitation caused by two incompatible waters. And on the right side here is the precipitation of wax as temperature is changed. Both are inside of a porous media, both are inside of our uh, system, and you can measure both uh, independently, but at the same time uh, using our tools. So you can use one testing platform to look for both inorganic and organic scale. However, one thing I'll keep in, ask you to keep in mind is rarely are you going to see any one of these in isolation. They're probably going to happen all at the same time, which can make diagnosing challenging. However, I did say that they were quite different, but ultimately there are a lot of commonalities uh, between organic and inorganic scales. Um, they're caused by very different processes. However, um, we can think of them both as very dependent on temperature, pressure, and the presence of other chemistry. So it's really important whenever we're trying to characterize these to understand that temperature and pressure are going to dominate the behavior of both of these fluids. And then we can control and mitigate and understand how those fluids change when they're in the presence of other chemistry. So you have to be able to control for all three of these variables to truly understand what's going on. So on the right side there, what, I've, what we've got is a couple of examples of uh, formation damage caused by uh, in, uh, inorganic as well as organic scaling. Uh, so on the top big picture there is, is uh, some scale that came from conate water mixing with frac water uh, that caused severe plugging. And then on the inset there is, is actually an inset from another test, but that's friction reducer that has um, degraded for, due to temperature because it was not tolerant to the temperature in the reservoir. So you get both kinds um, and both kinds can be seen in various types of test. Ultimately, we want to understand scaling tendency as the likelihood of precipitation um, in any system and is generally an indicator of severity and the type of scaling for any fluid or fluid combination. Um, and we look at both um, holistically at interface. Once we have inorganic scale, though, so to go back to this, this uh, inorganic scale side, because you could probably spend a whole hour talking about um, hydrocarbon solids, Really, we have uh, two things that we want to understand when it comes to scaling risk in our oil fields. First, we need to be able to measure the problem in order to understand if we have a problem that can be done both in the lab as a, you know, a temperature, um, like lab testing. You can also use um, thermophysical modeling or software modeling to understand based on your water report, how likely you are to have that scale. Ultimately, though, it's not necessarily about when measuring the problem. We want to understand what we're going to do about it. And so typically when we talk about scale, it's about inhibition or preventing it from happening in the first place, or I've got scale. How do I get rid of it? And so on the right side here is um, just a way for folks to start to understand how does scaling happen and where do different chemistries get involved? Um, pre, you know, before Adam mentioned uh, chelators. So if we walk through the process of scale, a scaling process, we start with a fluid that is now, you know, super saturated with some kind of precipitate or some kind of uh, reaction material that is looking for a way to precipitate. So if you're injecting a chelator, what you're trying to do is prevent that, uh, that incompatible uh, material from nucleating. So it's going to prevent it from even turning into a solid. Um, however, once we have nucleation or it finds a place to begin crystal growth, uh, we can start in, in, uh, injecting inhibitors that actually prevent the growth of these crystals. So you go from nucleation, they're going to stop growing those crystals. However, once we have a crystal that may have deposited onto sand particles, tubing, wellheads, wherever, um, we can still get involved and still work on managing those. So we can look at crystal growth modifiers that will reduce the rate that those grow. And hopefully by slowing that growth rate, you can uh, dislodge them more easily. Um, but once you've got crystals, they're going to stick and they stick hard. Um, and you can have crystal, you can have products that will either prevent flocculation or create, you know, are able to disperse those products. So within the management of scale, it's not just about inhibiting scale, it's understanding well, what point am I trying to change how this scale is, is growing or changing or even showing up in the first place. And so there's a lot of ways to uh, understand that. So having talked a bit about, you know, scaling tendency now, and I've talked a bit about friction reducer, um, 
what are the smoking guns? How is your, how is this actually going to show up on your systems when you're out in the field? What should you look for? So things to some evidence you might look for, you know, if you are pumping a frack and you're having to increase your FR loading during fracturing, just to keep your rates up, likely you've got some kind of incompatibility or, or dosing problem. Um, also, if you go to the field and you look inside your mixing tank and you take a sample, uh, just even in a simple bottle, put it in a bottle and give it a shake, um, you should see viscosity um, while you're pumping. Um, if you see inconsistencies, cloudiness, any kind of solids that are in that little jar, um, you've got a problem, whether that's an, a hydration problem, a solubility problem, but you've got an incompatibility happening there. So you should see viscosity and it should be uh, sort of nice and clear. Um, once you've actually pumped these fluids and you start producing back, if you're producing solids that are not what you expected, um, that's definitely an, uh, an indicator, but also if you've got really tight emulsions, um, a lot of these particles really like to create emulsions and then you might end up with really challenging emulsions that'll take down separators or other production systems. Lastly, keep an eye out for if you've got cloudy water or orange water going in or coming out of your system. Uh, so on the bottom there is an example of water samples we got at Interface. Um, the formation water was really nice and clear. Frac water was bright yellow. And when we mix them together, you can see it goes from very clear to starting to get cloudy. And so we see that change in the iron two plus that Adam was talking about before to that precipitation, that bright orange solid that's coming out, that's your iron three plus. So it is a real clear indicator that we've got a problem. So how can you manage these risks? So our goal here today is to give you some key questions and some key measurements that can help you quantify the risk and manage it. First thing to do though, is when you're trying to understand risk is really stop and think about your goal. You know, the most common question I have is, I just need to make sure my chemistry does its job. I need it to carry propent, I need it to create fractions, I need to make oil afterwards. I mean, like that's the baseline we're starting from, but you might also wanna find an alternative water source to so the fresh water you're using. You might wanna optimize your chemistry package for either cost or flexibility uh, from a supply chain perspective. You may want to try out new products because there's always new new ways of looking at these problems. Um, is it worth switching or is it even worth piloting? As well as, you know, is there anything in my fluid package that's having an outsized impact on performance? And like we said before, there's a laundry list of products that go into these fracturing packages. Is there something in there that is either having an outsized impact positively or negatively that if we break it down and say, well, what is the individual performance of all these products? Can we uh, optimize that process? But I think we'll focus today on just the simplest. You know, how do I keep, just make sure my chemistry is doing its job. So you're gonna probably see in the process of bu building up your friction reducer or your, your purchases, you're gonna see these spec sheets. An FR spec sheet is gonna show some kind of friction reduction potential, some kind of viscosity expectations, molecular weight before and after breaking, potentially, uh, definitely solubility. And, and some vendors will have done regain conductivity testing um, to look at formation damage. Question to ask um, anybody who's showing you spec sheets are, is this really the same as field performance? And how, the way we find that out is to look at are the specifications that are on that spec sheet based on real fluid samples at the temperatures and pressures that we saw in the field, or were they tested in simplified systems, either fresh water or simple brines? Because often it's really hard to build this, you, it'd be really hard to build a spec sheet based on every water and every system. Um, you may need to do that, you may need not need to do that, but it's a good question to ask is, you know, is my water system materially different than what it was originally tested in? And so when you're looking at lab data or other data that people have collected to try and prove that to you, um, you wanna look at five things. First is repeatability. If you repeat, and what we mean by that is if you repeat the same experiment over and over again, do you get the same results? That is quite a rare uh, thing in oil field chemistry. And ideally, if you have multiple labs run the same experiment, they should also get the same results. You should also be able to isolate your variables uh, in, your, in your experiments that are doing in the lab. So making sure that different level, different tests that you might be uh, exposed to are gonna have different levels of control over variables. The best tests are gonna have the most control over those. 
Um, it should be done at representative conditions for your system, temperature, pressure, porous media, as well as really good samples. Um, another really great indicator is direct versus an indirect measurement. Are you able to see what's happening and understand mechanisms, or are we doing something like a mass balance? Because often if we look at things like core floods or other porous media tests in, in, in our space, those are indirect measurements. We're looking at pressure drops. We're looking at mass balances. That's not an indicator of what's actually going on. It's just an indicator of effect. And so if we want to start diagnosing, you need to understand mechanisms. And finally, uh, the thing we always uh, say, and you know, we have to acknowledge our own bias here, we're a testing company that's independent, but having an independent uh, result to understand your chemical performance is really critical because there's a lot of incentives that can go both ways. Um, when you have a person doing your testing and also selling you products. So if we go back to, I just need to make sure my chemistry is doing its job. How do we, how do we make that decision? How do we understand that problem? There really is no defined set of tests that will tell you the answer here. However, we believe that by taking the water risk matrix that we showed earlier to give you some ideas of where to look in your water for risk, as well as some high quality testing options, you can confidently put together an actionable data collection plan that will allow you to make a decision. Um, and this is the point where we're gonna start getting into some of the case studies and examples of how we do things uh, at Interface. And I think this is the area where, again, we have to acknowledge our bias because you know we're here as a testing company. We want the, the, our, the best outcome for us is ultimately the best data for our clients. Um, and we don't have any outcomes or we don't have any expectations on what success or failure looks like on an individual product level. So at Interface, when we develop testing methods, um, we really are trying to create true isolation of the chemistry variables that will allow us to understand and capture performance of your fluid package holistically. Repeatability, variable isolation, condition like representative conditions, as well as direct measurement um, are all things that are must-haves for us. Uh, at interface as well, you know, we maintain our independence of, of outcomes. And so we have three tests that are primarily focused on the problems we've talked about today. Um, the first is our flowback test. It's a highly repeatable process for holistically testing your full fluid package that gives us the ability to look at chemical compatibility, water compatibility, and oil compatibility all in one test. Um, it is the only way to get Nano Darcy flow through porous media testing um, to really understand formation damage um, in a total system, all at pressure and temperature. Now, flow back is a, you know, like we said, it's holistic. It's it's a large, um, you know, we try and capture the, everything that's going on. If you want a simpler, quick screening for friction reduction damage potential, uh, we do a test we call regain conductivity that's similar to prop and packs and other tests like that. It's about 50% cheaper than that. Um, and we get extreme repeatability in this test. It's, it's one of the uh, tests that we have the highest repeatability in anything that we do. Um, and it also gives the highest resolution permeability damage measurement uh, on the market today. Uh, and finally, uh, interface uh, performs scaling tendency testing. And this is very similar. Uh, our method is very similar to a dynamic scale loop, but we've just miniaturized it and given full visual access to what's going on inside as those fluids are mixing. So we're mixing fluids at high pressure, high temperature, and directly observing scaling tendency, whether that's organic or inorganic. So we'll go through two case studies here. Uh, the first is, you know, how do we go about building a data collection plan for uh, one of our clients? Uh, the, this was a, a gentleman named Michael Mast. He was uh, previously at a company called Primax. He's now at a company called uh, Civitas Re Resources. Um, and we were looking at surfactants uh, additives for his fracturing package to understand value proposition there. So uh, Primax's goal was to move from freshwater to produced water. Uh, they were seeking to validate claims from their chemistry companies that the chemistry wouldn't be significantly impacted by uh, those high TDS fluids. They were struggling to reduce their fracturing fluid costs without jeopardizing production because they didn't have the data to understand the decision they were making. And finally, the chemistry that was being used uh, was expensive and the performance mechanisms were unclear to them. So we worked with them to run a suite of tests on our flowback test that I described earlier. This is the, in this test, we're measuring the combined effect of chemistry, oil, and water on how oil, how uh, the flow rate of oil through a representative porous media. 
Uh, the chemical performance here is measured by measuring how much oil is produced through this nano Darcy permeability uh, system after frac fluid has been injected uh, all at a constant pressure drop. Uh, so you can see here, we're measuring how much oil is produced over a set period of time at a set pressure drop. So the results here were uh, really excellent. You can see we've got uh, good repeatability data across all of these and good differentiation between products. Previously, Primax had been pumping sample P3 um, in tap water at 1.5 gallons per thousand. Uh, so the this box over here, it was a really, you know, in this case, it was a high performing product in tap water. However, uh, we can see that when it was added into different fluids, um, it did not really maintain or have significantly different performance. So being able to move from tap water to produce water or, or high salinity water, you can see here, there's one product sample P4 that overperformed drastically in those um, produced water situations. We had significantly increased production volumes. And we also saw that uh, in almost all cases, reducing the concentration of the product uh, actually increased the performance of the products. So we, the loading um, that was being supplied was, was too high for uh, maximal efficiency. And since we're looking at pretty expensive products here, um, this is a good way to understand whether or not we're spending our money correctly. So the key learnings here that uh, Primex was able to get was that the chemical performance was not predictable based on how it performed in fresh water. So in t high TDS water, that we, we didn't we weren't able to correlate both of those. It was it was not consistent. Um, reducing the loading of the chemistry also increased production in almost all cases. Um, and surfactants were the thing we were testing uh, primarily in this case. Uh, typically, when you're looking at a surfactant, they're marketed based on interfacial tension and critical micelle concentration um, statistics. However, those measurements will always trend towards more equals more until you, you know, there's a there's a breakover point, but more fluids are going to reduce your IFT and um, make better CMC measurements. However, when you put this into a nanoscale porous media like we have in shale, um, we saw that our results were actually counter to this because under nano confinement, surfactants uh, can absorb onto surfaces, which reduces the effective permeability of the system. Even though you're having this uh, change in wettability that you'd want, you can also ma materially change the actual pore throat size. This is not captured in other tests and why you might be getting uh, testing that is, that is counter to what you've traditionally seen. So on the right, there is a simple diagram of what a uh, nanofluidic channel might look like if you it was fully uh, saturated with um, uh, surfactant molecules. So once this, uh, we did this work for Primax, uh, they changed up the, the chemistry to the chemistry that we suggested um, for a child well after drilling. So well A in this case was the parent well that was with the previous product and well B was the, the, the well that was where they pumped the the product that we suggested. It produced about 6% more oil after 180 days on production. I'm not sure we can take any uh, meaningful credit there. I'm not sure if that's within the noise of the system or not. However, one thing that we did see is that the oil production uh, started 10 to 15 days earlier, as well as reaching peak production in a similar amount of time. And you can see that clearly in this uh, blue line and where it overlaps the gray line. And so that's really, in this case, shows the value of that surfactant and, and what it was doing. So ultimately, uh, Primax was able to save about 50% on their chemical costs by identifying a proper uh, a surfactant that was compatible with their fluids and, and uh, finding a loading that was more compatible with their porous media. Uh, chemical reduce loadings were ultimately reduced by 300% uh, from 1.5 gallons per thousand down to 0 0.5 gallons per thousand. Um, and we were able to do this work in less than a month. So it was a quick turnaround. Second example here is looking at uh, how we approach scale formation and inhibition uh, in a water flood. So here we're looking at an alternative to our to a dynamic scale loop that is visual, high pressure, high temperature, and compatible with live fluids. So a North Sea producer approached Interface uh, about a water flood that they were conducting uh, in a conventional reservoir in, on the NCS. Uh, injectivity after startup quickly reduced to 60 to 70% of their predicted values. Um, and the suspected mechanisms were twofold. One was wax precipitation um, due to cooling from the cool water being injected into the hot reservoir, as well as scaling due to incompatible injection water. 
Um, both mechanisms were studied in the in the process, and we're hoping to publish a paper on the full study here uh, later this year. However, we're only going to talk about the scaling tendency here uh, in this case. Um, ultimately, the client came to us because they'd had little success in getting repeatable scaling tendency data from other labs that they'd worked with. So what we did is work on a microfluidic device that allowed us to co-flow two fluids at, this, at a constant flow rate. So what we're doing here is getting a baseline of just reservoir fluid flowing across a representative porous media, count, measuring the dr uh, pressure drop. And then what we do is we now start inject, injecting 50% uh, injection water and 50% uh, reservoir water at uh, the same flow rate as the previous step and looking at pressure drops and how that pressure builds because we want to be able to visualize uh, any scaling that's happening there as well as monitor pressure. We then use our machine vision software to quantify what's going on. So we did this at a number of temperatures because we knew we, we knew that the uh, from thermophysical modeling of the of the fluids that we would have different reaction products and different scaling tendencies at high pressure and uh, or high temperature and low temperature. So the well bore temperature here is about 22.5 degrees. 22.6 degrees, and you can see we have very little scaling happening. We do see small particles getting trapped in the porous media, um, but we have very little coverage of that porous media of scale, as well as uh, our pressure increases are very low. However, when those fluids increase in temperature, back to reservoir temperature, um, we can see drastic scaling happening here. And so we're plotting coverage as well as uh, pressure increase. And, you know, for those of you that are sitting here thinking, you know, this is offshore water flooding, how is this relevant to my frack? Think about it this way. When you inject the fluids, you're injecting at a cooler temperature, but between uh, finishing your frack and coming on production, those fluids are going to heat up. You're going to start having different reactions happen, and this scaling tendency is going to happen inside your uh, prop and pack, inside the tubing, wherever those fluids are happening as temperature increases. So what we were ultimately delivering to these folks is the relative damage factor. So what we see here is on this plot here at reservoir temperature, we see a four and a half times increase in the pressure required in order to, relative pressure in order to flow across this porous medium. So this is fairly significant damage and, and um, was sort of a smoking gun for the injectivity issues that were being had. We also looked at, uh, remember we talked about nucleation as a you know part of the mechanism of how scaling happens. So when we looked at the field filtration that's happening in the, um, when we have any uh, field filtration, they're filtering to 10 microns in the field. We can see scaling happening here. And then normally at interface, what we're doing is filtering to two microns as standard. And so we can see there's a significant difference in the amount of formation damage that is created during, just due to the amount of filtration that was, that was happening. And so, question that this could lead to is I've got bag filters on my location. You know, would I rather change a filter more often or have scaling happening down hole? You know, this is the kind of decision that you can be thinking about. And you can actually measure the impact that that's going to have. I see you got a question here. Um, I'll get to that at the end of the webinar. So ultimately scaling tendency for this client was studied as a function of temperature, filtration, and mixing. Um, by demonstrating the specific conditions that caused the scale to form, the client was able to confidently move forward with a mitigation strategy um, going forward. So that's the end of our uh, case studies here. And I just want to leave you with one last thing here is what are the questions that you can ask your suppliers? Um, so if, at the end of the day, the, you can ask the folks, is the performance quoted for chemistry based on standard fluids or tested on your fluids? If it was tested in fresh water, how did the performance change uh, in high TDS water if it was tested? Uh, was the full chemistry package tested or was that chemistry tested by itself? Um, the interactions of the chemistry, we have a lot of things that like to react inside of a frac package uh, or in other situations. We need to be looking at them holistically, not just by themselves. Um, were those tests performed at standard conditions or were they performed at process conditions? And finally, who did that test? Uh, was it an in-house test or was it a third-party test? And so with that, I'll say thank you very much, everybody. Um, Adam, is there anything you wanted to say before we open it up to Q&A? 
No, I think you covered everything really well. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. I will say thank you so much, everybody, for attending and looking forward to uh, continuing the conversation offline. Have a great day. Bye-bye.